We will now hear from Danielle Crozier, CEO of Women's Health New South Wales, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. I'm going to start with um, an acknowledgement of country. Uh, Western Sydney University acknowledged that today's event is being held on the country of the Dharawal, Tharawal people of the Darub Nation and acknowledge their ancestors who have been traditional owners of their country for tens and thousands of years. Western Sydney University also wishes to acknowledge and pay our respects to elders past and present. We celebrate the knowledge and living cultures of Indigenous Australians and acknowledge their important contribution to teaching, learning and research. We acknowledge that the activities currently delivered across our campuses are a continuation of teaching and learning that has occurred on these lands for tens and thousands of years. We also pay our respects to any First Nations people here today. In this spirit, we welcome any guests, all the guests to this event. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Western Sydney University Library Thought Leadership Event Series number 19. Today's topic, Understanding Women Living with Female Genital Mutilation Through Healthcare Settings in Australia by Associate Professor Oladi Ogunsiji. It is my privilege to present Associate Professor Oladi Ogunsiji as our distinguished speaker for this thought-provoking event. Associate Professor Oladi on Dunsiji from the School of Nursing in Midwifery at Western Sydney University is a leading researcher in the field of women's health. Her expertise lies in understanding the health challenges faced by migrant and refugee women, particularly focusing on the cultural complexities that influence their well-being. At the forefront of her research is a dedicated exploration into the sensitive and critical critical issue of female genital mutilation, often called FGM. Associate Professor Ogunsiji's work sheds light on the short and long-term health implications of this cultural practice, aiming to raise awareness and advocate for the optimum health care uh, of women and girls affected by FGM. Her commitment extends beyond academia as she actively engages with FGM practicing communities, healthcare providers and government agencies to contribute to the global effort to eliminate FGM and ensure better health outcomes for affected individuals. She also gives freely of her time as the chairperson of Blacktown Women and Girls Health Centre and the African Women's Health Association. Western Sydney University recognised for its exceptional commitment to sustainability and resilience is privileged to host such a distinguished scholar in the ongoing Thought Leadership event series. As the university leads the way in addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, this event serves as a testament to the dedication for advancing knowledge and fostering meaningful change in our communities. Please join us welcoming Associate Professor Oladi Ogunsiji as she shares her insights and research finding on this critical topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle, and good afternoon to everyone here at Chisakadi and online. Thank you very much for joining us for this presentation today. I also would like to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands where we are situated. And I pay my respect to all the elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you to Western Sydney University for this great privilege to showcase my research in the area of female genital mutilation cutting. I would like to start by saying that it is with all humility that I present the voices of women living with the short and long-term negative consequences of FGNC. Women who rely on the global community, researchers, 
healthcare providers, advocates, men and professionals to raise their voices in bringing an end to FGNC. My research sits within the Western Sydney University's research team of health and well-being. And within School of Nursing and Midwifery, Women's Health, the same thing, and maternal and infant um, health. I would like to showcase this um, trigger warning that some of the content that I'll be presenting today uh, contain harmful or uh, traumatizing um, you know, content for some people. And I would just encourage you if you need to, uh, to speak to somebody, um, we can use any of the uh, employee assistance program or free counseling services. Looking at female genital mutilation, according to World Health Organization, it refers to all procedures that include partial or total removal of external female genitalia or other injury to female genital organs for non-medical reasons. Currently, more than 200 million girls and women that are alive today have undergone female genital mutilation in the countries where the practice is concentrated. And every year, an estimated amount of 3 million girls are at risk of undergoing the practice. And what we know currently is that if nothing is done by the year 2030, annually up to 4 million girls will be at risk of the practice. It is mostly done on girls before they reach the age of accountability or age where they can give consent. Looking at the fact that majority of the girls have been done before they reach age 15. Female genital mutilation is associated with significant immediate and, and long-term complications, which include physical, mental, sexual health, and well-being. If, uh, among the immediate um, health consequences include significant pain as at the time at which it is being done, uh, severe bleeding, and many times infection. Long-term consequences include sexual and reproductive health issues, mental health issues, and difficulties maintaining relationship. Female genital mutilation is also known as female circumcision and female cutting among communities that practice this um, cultural um, practice kind of. However, because of the significant um, cause consequences because of the violation of the rights of human I mean, children as a result of it being double there when before they become accountable. And so many other complications, it has captured global attention and is being referred to globally as female genital mutilation. However, to remain culturally sensitive to Communities that practice it as a result of reasons that include rite of passage for their girls, um, love of a mother for their daughters, and also to um, appreciate and uh, present our understanding of the complications that are associated with it. Every now and then, you always find me referring to it as FGNC, and that is to attract wider audience of communities that practice it and women and girls that continue to live with 
the devastating outcome and experiences of having undergone FGHC. There are four different types of female genital mutilation. And if uh, I look at uh, the, the very first picture diagram that I'm showing, this first one is the normal female external genitalia. It contains the clitoris, which is a very important part of the body that makes the woman to enjoy sexual relationships. It has the labia minora and labia majora. Everything is intact for the, the woman that is not hot. Meanwhile, the type one is referred to as clitoridectomy, which is the removal of the clitoris. And if you look at this, that are where my cursor is. Um, with countries and communities that practice type one, the clitoris is removed for their daughters. Type two is more severe. That is referred to as excision. In this case, the clitoris is removed. We can see the clitoris, the clitoral fold is removed. Um, labia minora plus or minus labia majora is removed. So this whole area are removed. And more often than not, with crude um, instruments, traditionally with blood knives, sometimes with stones, and some healthcare providers are now medicalizing it. But there is zero tolerance from the global community that healthcare providers must not practice it on, on girls because it goes contrary to their oath not to do harm. So after the um, looking at this type, part, uh, type two, this is what it looks like um, by the time it must have healed. At this stage, the clitoris is no longer there. The labia minora no longer there, or even labia majora will no longer be there. They are being removed. Type three is the most severe of them all. And that definitely includes the removal of the clitoral hood Removal of the labia minora and labia majora and all the external layers of the female genital um, organ are all removed. And we can see if we compare this with the previous one, this is the, the type 3 is more severe as involves many parts of the uh, woman or girl's external genital. So by the time that three is healed, it's only, the woman is only left with a tiny hole for her to pass blood during menstruation or to urinate. And everything that includes clitoris, um, labia majora, labia minora is all removed. So looking at all the pictures of the different types that I've presented, what we now find out is the woman that must have passed through that three has all the external parts of her genitalia cut off. Many times, the after cutting, they are sewn up tightly. The little hole is only left to urinate with a lot of difficulties many times. We have type four. Type four is all classified. And all this classification came out from World Health Organization. Type four is not classified. And it includes 
all injury, every injury modification to uh, female external genitalia for non medical reasons. And this includes breaking, scaring, stretching of the clitoris or labia or catheterization uh, uh, of the uh, clitoris and surrounding tissues. As a result of the ongoing devastation, the women and girls that must have passed through female genital mutilation cutting must have experienced. In 2015, the global community had FGMC as one of the harmful practices that must be eliminated by the year 2030. FGMC is a violation of human rights because of the age at which girls are subjected to it. It is a women's health issue as a result of the ongoing women's health complications during the time of menstruation, during the time of childbirth, and ongoing issues with urination, ongoing issues with sexual and reproductive experiences. It is actually a violation of human rights to live in instances where girls die as a result of severe bleeding at the time of the uh, cuts. So that is why it is um, a, a, a crucial component of the global agenda that the whole world would need to work towards in bringing it to an end by the target year 30. That's it. Female genital mutilation sits within, well, within two of the goals. Goal, goal three, which is goal of good health, and goal five. These are the 17 sustainable development goals that are listed here. However, it was clearly mentioned and stated in goal 5.3. And that is to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early uh, forced marriage, and female genital mutilation. A winding an edge to it by the year 2030, the World Health Organization paid important attention to healthcare workers in bringing an edge to the practice. And what are they supposed to do? The global community depends on healthcare providers to ensure that they support and improve health and well-being of women and girls living with FGFC. Clearly, in the global document, nurses and midwives um, are recognized as being in the forefront for influencing and changing attitudes towards LGMC because of the prolonged uh, relationship and uh, care they provide to women and girls living with the practice. They are also to demonstrate their tolerance for medicalization of FGMC. And with this global demand, my work in the last 15 years I've been asking the question, how can the global community eradicate a practice for which little is known about? We continue to ask the question, how can healthcare providers in countries where the practice is not prevalent provide the required support and improvement of health outcomes for women and girls treated with FGMC? So my work in those 15 years have targeted raising awareness about FGMC and collaborating with community of practice in enhancing their capacity to provide important health care for women and girls living with FGMC. 
And quickly to talk about why you will ask the question, how did I actually get into this program of research? And what has sustained me on the program of research for this long? I am from one of the 30 African countries where the practice is prevalent. There are 54 countries in total in Africa, African continent, but 30 of these 54 countries have got significant number of women and girls living with it, and it is more prevalent in these countries. Meanwhile, the practice is also prevalent, not only in Africa, but in the Middle East, in some Southeast Asian countries, and uh, in those areas of the world. And at the moment, FGMC is actually reported on over the world due to human mobility. In Australia, in case we are sitting here, we say, oh, it is an issue for some countries out there. As we are speaking, about 53,000 women and girls that have had the practice done in their countries of birth are living in Australia. And these are the women that we presented for healthcare in Australia healthcare system. I, apart from being from one of the countries that practice FGM, my PhD thesis also pointed it out as an important health issue for women living in Australia. That PhD, which was updated in 2009, titled Meaning of Health and Health Seeking Behavior of West African Migrants Women in Australia, was a qualitative study. And what the women told me then <clears throat> is what I put in this quote here. Says, I know that a very high percentage of African women have been genitally mutilated. They, they sh that is, Australian healthcare workers, should, in the process of questioning, find out from them if they went through such a process and if they found out that they sh and if they found out they should be able to do something to help them to have self delivery and probably reduce complications. So, that flagged an important area of need for me in this area. So post PhD, I've been working together with practicing communities, communities of practice. These are those that are healthcare providers, nurses, midwives, um, allied health providers, academics, health departments, and non-profit organization. In answering the question, that I raised the other time about raising awareness and enhancing the capacity of healthcare providers to care for women and girls living with FGMC. So in collaboration with all these organizations, these universities, Western Sydney University is collaborating with health services, non-governmental organizations, international communities and countries in raising awareness about FGMC and enhancing the capacity of healthcare providers to deliver on the global mandate. With the first C grant that was uh, awarded by Western City University, we conducted uh, a study among the midwives to find out what they know about FGMC. It was a qualitative study. And what we found out was the fact that these midwives, they had limited knowledge of FGMC. They reported that it was not part of their training. And if at all it was mentioned in the course of their three years of training, it was mentioned in passing as one of the cultural practices that they will find out there. Many of them reported that they forget to ask women if they were caught at all, suggesting if there is any of the women that passed through there, there was there were many instances of missing the important fertility of care. 
and paramount in the types that were missed was type 1. The midwives were missed in the midwives were missed findings from this particular study is already published, like I'm projecting on here. The midwives confirmed the health issues they have come across among women with their GHC. And from what I'm projecting, they say, I've seen ruptured bladders. I've seen women who have get menstrual buildup for months and months. Women who are totally incontinent as a result of FGM. Yet women with cysts inclusion cysts. Some of them have had to have surgery to have sex. There's all sorts of gynecological problems that can continue. There has been terrible trauma. Another midwife said, they, that is circumcised women, can be caught into the bowel and they have abscesses. They have sebastial cysts. They get a lot of complications. Said, I've had experience with some women. They are quite resistant. They are quite resistant in, like I said before, they are quite embarrassed about it. That is circumcision. And these are all from the voices of Australian midwives confirming that women living with LGMC are presented to their care. We conducted another um, qualitative study, this time around among women living with LGMC. They spoke about how and who was responsible or, you know, through who they were caught. One of them said, my mother's family made the decision to circumcise me. And from the voice of another woman, she said she actually looked forward to having it done, even though the father was against it. FGMC communities where it is practiced is usually celebrated. It is considered as a, as a rite of passage. And at a particular point in time, when girls get caught, they usually have parties and exchange of gifts. And that is what they fall, this woman here, that said, my father was not happy. He even disagreed. But my mother and my mother's parents, even myself, by the time, we were saying, oh, daddy, of course myself and one of my stepsisters. Daddy would really want to go there. We want to be a woman. My mother went to people asking them to go and plead to add to, to, to bleed to that for him to accept. Then our father's elder sister was also there. She also went and met our father. Our father disagreed. But we ourselves, myself and my sister, went and met our daddy. Dad, we really want to go there. That is, we really want to get circumcised. We really want to be caught. So, that had no choice because it's hard ones. From the, as a result of the ongoing complications and suffering that is associated with the long-term complications of FGMC, these women also told us that the time they were getting caught, by the time they were advocating to be caught, they were not aware or they could not imagine the ongoing implications on the other. However, the deed is already done. And so the women said, you see, so really, my heart bleeds. Very stark. Really, it's not good. Not good. Not good at all for women. Sometimes when I see it, I cry. So these women, as a result of the ongoing suffering, they have yielded themselves to be part of the advocacy to bring an end to LGLC. And in their voice, they said, me, I will tell you, stop it. I'm chairperson in my community. I talk to every woman. No good, if I see or hear, I will go straight away to the prime minister to tell them. And this is one of the publications from that study. Part of what the midwives told us in the previous research that I spoke about was the fact that they, they were not aware of what happened to the women after they had discharged postnatally. There was a compromised continuity of care. Western Sydney University funded another research that looked at the experiences of primary health care. We wanted to know 
what do primary health care are aware of in providing care for these women after they are discharged from the postnatal ward? Important thing that this midwife, that the primary health care providers told us was their limited knowledge of FGS. Very poor insight by women's self nurses, and we by limited knowledge as well. And there was gross uh, poor understanding or knowledge of insight of FGMC by allied health providers. These primary health care providers give us important insights of how to progress the research. They said if the aims to support the women who have experienced FGMC, then we need to involve the women. It's just, for me, it's just like black and white. It's like, if they are not involved, then how can we possibly eliminate FGMC or change FGMC practices? But also involving everyone, involving men and involving children, the community. It's all important. So we got those important insights from them. And that research is also published. Already, the research that we are doing now, we have used qualitative approaches to explore the voices of midwives, the women living with the primary health care providers who are supposed to provide the continuity of care. And the current research that we are working on at the moment is using innovative body mapping approach to get women tell us what does it look like living with female genital mutilation cutting. And I present one of the body maps of the women that took part in the current study that we are analyzing at the moment. This is Lala. She told us that she was uh, circumcised when she was nine years old. And she painted a lot of people around her head. In her head, she put shock, depression, um, emotional health problems, and spiritual. And all over her body, very prominently, we saw the symbol of a knife piercing through her, a symbol of, of, uh, of a heart. To her, in a, a follow-up uh, interview, where she unpacked her drawing, she said FGMC is like having a knife passing through her heart, that it stays there and it is all the way. She drew, um, she had some writing about difficulty menstruation, difficulty urination, infection, genital tissues, sexual problems, childbirth problems. When the um, analysis of this is completed, we will publish it similar to other uh, previous ones that were done. So apart from the research that Western Sydney University is collaborating with other institutions, organizations, universities, non-for-profit organizations and community groups, we are also involved in raising awareness of negative consequences among practicing communities. In alignment with Western Sydney University to start from the West, we are collaborating with community groups, <coughs> working in collaboration with um, services like New South Wales FGM uh, education programs, we are raising awareness in the community. And I'm glad that a number of people that we are working in that space are here physically and online. And I thank you all for our collaboration. These are some of the other community groups, and we can see in this particular photo, women stretching for their hands to say, stop it, stop FGMC. Apart from working closely in raising awareness in the community, Western Sydney University continues to collaborate with academics, with community groups as well, through celebration and collaborate, uh, 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 commemorating International Day of Zero Tolerance. And this is one of them in 2021. I remember in one of the quotes before, uh, among the primary healthcare workers to research, they suggested that we we'll work with men. And I'm very glad that in this photo here, we have one of the men that is 
we walk in with those stairs. And the number has actually increased, which you will see very short. Just in 2024, about a couple of weeks ago, together with Multicultural Health Service, the Southwest FGM uh, Education Program, academics, uh, and the community, uh, we commemorated 2024 International Day of Zero, Zero Tolerance for FGN, where um, a teacher session was organized. And we can see heads of men here that we are working with in recent awareness. Apart from this, even within the New South Wales FGN Education Program, we have a clinical nurse there that we are working together with community of practice midwives, nurses, um, allied health providers to raise awareness, share ideas on how women can better be supported. Apart from the face-to-face -face program of the International Day of Zero Tolerance, in 2022 and 2023, Western Sydney University led the first ever virtual um, event to commemorate international Day of Zero Tolerance. That was in 2022 and 2023. Uh, Western Sydney University led that as well. And we work with lead organizations like NETFA in Victoria. This uh, virtual event uh, attracted service providers, community organizations, groups, and academics across Australia in all the states and territories, and some participants from the United States of America. Our program of research have been, uh, so we have spoken about the research we have done, called our advocacy with the community. The University of Western Sydney, Western Sydney University is championing it as well, two times in a row. It was showcased in uh, the university's flagship magazine, uh, Future Makers. So in issue five, the, pro the, program, uh, the program of research was showcased, and in a special issue, um, gender equality, it's also uh, showcased in that future makers. And as a result of our own way work, um, a, a female genital mutilation awareness Australia, uh, Australia advocacy group was also formed with co-founders Fatou Sina from Victoria and at his school from Queensland. So this young lady here in this particular photo, this is Fatou, who we are working together in ensuring that the voices go further. Apart from Australia, apart from locally, Australian new voices were also included in 2021. And I will play this video of young people from Australia who added their own voices to the advocacy work. And so in collaboration with NFGF Canada, Australian youths added their voice that FGN must be stopped. Hi, my name is Adine from Sydney, Australia, but I'm religious from South Sudan. Female genital mutilation is a real of out of female genitalia for no medical reason. This is a girl's and women's health issue that requires special attention. This year, as we celebrate the notorious of FGM, we also know to FGM. My name is Mejwak. I live in Australia and I'm originally from South Sudan. I believe female genital cutting is a violation of human rights and no girl should be made to suffer for it. I call on global community to arise and say no to female genital cutting. Hi, my name is Sayo and I am passionate about ending female genital mutilation because I believe it's a crime against womanhood. It punishes women for what they are naturally born with and the body parts that they have and um, I don't believe that that should be the case. Um, I believe it's important that we as hu as humans, men, women, and everyone who cares for their fellow human beings rally against governments that still allow this barbaric practice, against individuals that are perpetrating um, this practice and making sure that there are criminal actions that are brought against them and also that the practice is ended. I believe it's also important to make sure that we pro uh, provide support to survivors um, of the practice and to hear their stories, to hear what they have continued to deal with as a consequence so that we can ensure that this practice is not passed on to the next generation. 
My name is Dara and I'm passionate about putting an end to female genital mutilation. I'm quite passionate about putting an end to female genital mutilation because of the devastating and long-lasting effects it has on those who have been victims of female genital mutilation. I strongly believe that female genital mutilation has its roots in patriarchy and attempts to dictate how women should use their bodies and how women should enjoy their bodies the way it was created. This is a call out to Scott Morrison and all the other members of Parliament of Australia to come behind us to support the banning and complete banning of this abhorrent act all around the world. It's the, it's a, the time is now. Female genital mutilation must end. So a great shout out to all the young people that are part of the um, global effort to end FGMC. So in conclusion, with all the humanity again, I have presented the voices of women living with the short and long-term negative consequences of FGMC. Women who rely on the global community, researchers, healthcare providers, advocates, men and professionals to strengthen their voices. And there is a quote here from Juju, who was one of the women that took part in the body mapping uh, research that we are currently analyzing. She said, I cry because I talk about it. I did it to you. You are a professional health provider. You can put my worries down in the right way. Make it strong. Do you know why I open up my heart now? Because you are qualified and you know how to put it in the right way. And this is what continues to energize me as I pursue this program of research. Thank you for listening. These are my references and... So we've got a lot of questions online and we've got our roving mic here. So if anyone has any questions in the room that you have for Associate Professor, Professor Ogansaji, just um, raise your hands or come around with the mic. We'll like to start with online then. Uh, maybe quite thought provoking. We've had a few questions come in. I'll pass over to Badger. There are a lot of comments and questions. So let me go to the top one. First question is from Meda. And that is, what is the level of FGM in Australia? And what are the most prevalent forms? Where is the procedure most often? performed in relation to women living in Australia? Is it, is it in Australia or overseas? How often do medical professionals in Australia come across FGM in their practice? Multiple questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, like I said the other time, at the moment, about 53,000 women living with the practice are in Australia at the moment. They put the majority of them have had it done in their countries of birth when they were children. But here as adults, women presented to maternity care in the course of uh, pregnancy and childbirth, we find them presented to uh, our healthcare services. Um, in terms of which part is it part of the body? Do you mind reading the question again? Sorry. Yeah, I don't know whether that will answer your question with regards to where it was done. Majority of parts it all. Sorry, I'll, I'll get back to the question. It's about what Aust what is in Australia? What is the tendency in Australia? Uh, where the procedure most often performed in relation to women in Australia or in overseas? All the types of FDNC have been reported in Australia. Or whether all of them are captured is a rather ball game. Like I mentioned the other time, um, many women that are living with type 1 are missed. And some midwives, when they even ask women, you know, questions during the time of um, history taking at the antenatal care, in the first study that was presented among the midwives, some of the women, not some of the midwives actually said, many times they prayed that the woman will not say yes. 
And if the woman should say yes, it is now, this is going to be another level. Who do I refer the woman to? So all the four types are reported here. Among the women that are presented to care in the healthcare system, in Australia, it is a criminal offence and the communities are aware of that. What that then suggests is that it is now become a closed door, hash hash, closed mouth practice. Why do I say that? There are some instances of court cases uh, associated with them that have been reported in Australia at the moment. None of the women that uh, took part in the study told me about they seen me, but they reported that they know it's still taking place behind closed doors. And apart from that, the midwife spoke about some women who they would have opened up. You know, when I was showing um, type three, um, suggesting only small hope for women to do their menstruation and uh, and also to urinate. For them to for for those women that have got through type three, for them to give birth. In Australia, the clinical intervention is for them to be opened up through the process called defibrillation. So the, the area that is tightly sewn are cut so that the baby can be born. And what the midwives are now telling us is representation of women. By the time they now have what to have another baby and they are presented, they, they look at their history. They were once upon um, with their previous pregnancy were up, open in order to allow space for the baby to be born. But now she's presented with another pregnancy, she's sewn back again. So there are instances of women going back to their countries of birth to harm themselves soon again. And some of the special they provided, there was a particular midwife who actually uh, used her hand to demonstrate what it was for a woman that has lived all her life, wearing herself, living with only a small hole to pass urine or even to have period, now open up to have uh, babies. Uh, she said for those women, they feel as if all their internal organs were to come up. So because of the psychological, emotional disconnection about the body that they have lived to see as the normal, the alteration to that from those women, the midwife said, these women go back to their country so bad to be so bad. And that is why the voices of the primary healthcare providers cannot be disregarded, but to continue to work with the communities so that we partner with them. And one of my publications says, even beyond illegality, there is need to partner with the women to see the need to bring it to an end if possible, in our generation. But like we know, the global, the global agenda is 2030. We are just six years away. The question is, are we there yet? There's another question from Kayla. Uh, that is, would FGMC increase the likelihood of STI, HIV, or BBB acquisition? Uh at, at the moment, we have really not, um, any, none of our research have pointed at that, whether from the women or from the, um, from the midwives or even from primary healthcare providers. But it is, it is not um, unlikely because it is part of the sexual um, you know, it is, it is the sexual and reproductive part of a woman's body that is being affected in such a situation. But none of our research have actually identified that so far. Thanks, Oliti. Sharina asked a question. If healthcare workers are asking good patients if they have undergone such a procedure, should they be using it some different terms? Do patients always recognize the term FGMC? Yes, that is the work that we are 
where, that we are currently, um, you know, progressing with community of practice. It is culturally insensitive to ask a woman from a practicing community whether she has been mutilated. Because in those communities, they don't refer to it as mutilation. As a matter of fact, for mothers in those communities, it is the law of their daughters that make them to subject them to that practice. For many of the mothers and grandmothers in those communities, their intention is to prepare their daughters for marriage. Their intention is to prevent their daughters from being promiscuous. Their intention is to make their daughters to have a sense of belonging. So when midwives or healthcare providers refer to it as mutilation, instantly they lose the trust of the uh, of the women. So the the culturally sensitive term that we suggest that we use is cut. As a matter of fact, one of some of the midwives in the first study that we, we conducted, we asked how does she engage women in conversation around that. Some of the midwives said they would just go straight and ask, you know, they would do some drawing. Have you been caught in this part of the body? Or some of the midwives said they will start talking around general women's health topics before they now come down and then say, at any point in time, I, I mean, do you know or are you aware that that part of your body has been caught? And we also found that there are some women that have been living with type, type 1 or even type 2 that did not know because their parents did that for them when they were very young. So they have been living with it. That's what they knew their body to look like. And some of the women actually see those that are living with the clitoris, labia minora, labia majora as the ones that are abnormal. But with education and with some of the um, sexual and reproductive health issues that, are, that they are presenting with, they are coming to have that insight into the devastating impact of the practice that have been done on them when they were young. Thank you. Uh, you can ask because I have to write some more questions. Anybody, any questions from the audience? We do also have some comments uh, that addressed. Um, oh, yes, you do. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's really enlightening and it has really helped me more. The question I would like to ask, is there any current work in the area of how women enjoy sexual intimacy with their spouses, especially with those who live with uh, FGM. Have we worked on that or how does that intend to influence maybe happiness in marriage and the likes? I don't know if we have done something like that. Thank you so much for that question. In the current body of work that is using innovative body mapping approach, <clears throat> the issue of sexual and reproductive um, health implications are coming up very strongly. And women are reporting that they are not enjoying sex with their husbands. And um, current work as well, apart from that research that is using body mapping, the current work that we are doing as well with the uh, with New South Wales LGM education program and with community of practice. As a matter of fact, last month there was the study day, and I, I believe Linda is on now. Big shout out to that the team of people in New South Wales LGM um, education program. I'm talking about Linda, Nat, Titi, Monica, and all of them that are there. In the study day, a sexologist was brought in because prior to that particular study day, uh, one of the focus group discussion uh, among the group, according to Linda, she said, uh, because one of my colleagues in UTS, Professor uh, Ajida Dawson, she in one of the focus group discussion, the women said, let's talk about sex because we're having difficulty in, you know, in relating that area with our husband. So in response to that, Linda, then, you know, we brought a sexologist in. And apart from that, there is also some application that are put in currently that I'm aware of that is to 
actually ask the women to talk more, bring the issue of sexual reproductive complications, the issue of relating with their husbands, the impact on ongoing relationship, marriage relationship, to bring that to the fore, and then work closely upfront with relevant and providers that can support women in the area of sex and sexual relationship. Thank you. There's another question. Oh, sorry. I'll go with a uh, question from Caroline Bayer. Is there any data mapping rates of medically unnecessary practices by geographic location in Australia? That is, where is it occurring most? Um, there is none at the moment. But looking at the um, geographical location, of people from background where it is prevalent and Australian population generally. People from culturally and linguistically diverse background, majority of them are in New South Wales, Victoria, and then, you know, growing number in Queensland. But having said that, as a result of visa status, people relocating for a number of reasons, family reunion, they are all spread out through Australia. So in terms of mapping of where it is more, we could just extrapolate from the look uh, from the concentration of women and girls from background where it is prevalent. Where are they living? We find majority of them in your southwards, in Victoria and in uh, and in Queensland and growing to other parts of the states and territories. And also, having said that, for many years, we were not aware of the number of women that are living with it in Australia until uh, then 2017, when Australian Institute of uh, Health and Wellbeing led the determination of estimates of women living with the GMC in Australia. And that is how we were able to come up with the current figure that we have got, which is an estimate of women living with it, about 53,000 women and girls living with it in Australia. Thank you. Um, so I'll just add that Caroline Bayard has clarified that she's referring to behind closed doors practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we do not know. We do not know. But again, the ones that we have heard of, we have heard of some cases in New South Wales and um, some, some of them are actually celebrated cases. And uh, towards the end of last year in Western Australia. Thank you. Another question in the room. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation again. I'm just wondering, I know that um, the women of childbearing ages are privileged to you know, get these services. How about those that migrated, you know, that finished having children in overseas before coming? Probably because of the health impact of this uh, FGM, maybe having incontinencies and all that. How do we target them? Do we like maybe probably work with the GPs to provide these services for them as well? Because they don't go to the hospital to have children anymore, but they are also being affected. And the sexual relationship might also be an issue, but they don't have anybody to talk to. Thank you very much for pointing that out. That's a big gap in Australia in terms of services that are provided and even in terms of the research that we have out there. Majority of the services intervention in Australia today is paternity centric. Women in their childbearing ages. And our ongoing work is tending towards saying beyond the maternity, there are so many other health issues that either young women that have not reached marriageable ages and are having um, difficulty in having, um, you know, an ongoing relationship with their boyfriend or those that have passed childbearing ages and are living with a lot of incontinence. As a matter of fact, the, the body mapping uh, project that we are currently analyzing, we have some of the women really crying and weeping about the um that issue of continuing infection 
flooded, you know, fill up and all those that are going there. But then, thank you again for raising that. Those are other areas where research and researchers need to further pay attention to. And among my you know, collaborators and universities and uh, NGOs and communities that are working together, that is an area of paramount importance to us. But so far, we are flagging it and we're emphasizing it. It's pretty much maternity centric at the moment. Thank you. We've got um, a comment from Alison Morris online who says it would be great to understand how and when <clears throat> would be the best way to include a question around FGMC in the antenatal booking in process. And then it would also be great to know if we have a guideline for referral and support when a woman reveals they have experienced FGMC. Thank you very much. That is very, very important, very, 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 you know, um, crucial an area of ongoing work that needs to be done. Like I said, by the time we started this work in 20, about 15 years ago, there's minimal research that has been done in that area in Australia. I'm aware of, of some Australian researchers that are working overseas, but in terms of Australia, there is a big gap there. Uh, we are working together as well. Part of what the community of practice is trying to come up with is the uh, referral pathways. And there are some studies as well that I'm aware of that one of my um, colleagues, Professor uh, Dawson, with one of our students from UTS, uh, are trying to map out the kind of a pathway. But definitely, it should be very, very good. And um, in terms of where to ask the question, I'm aware that um, a number of maternity centers in New South Wales have got it actually included in the time of taking antenatal history. But the, again, the question is whether midwives feel comfortable asking that question or whether they are prepared when the answer is yes. Those are areas that require ongoing work in this space. Thank you. Thank you. We may have missed some questions in between, but we will share the chat and questions with you. And uh, in general, a lot of comments, a lot of appreciation for the topic, which is very sensitive and how you did. And a lot of thank yous to you. Thank you so much to everyone. I would like to thank you all. Thank you for listening. And a big shout out to Western Sydney University as well for the great support and encouragement that they have provided in the progressing of this research work. Thank you.